Thank you so much, Diana, and welcome everybody. It's wonderful to see you. It's wonderful to see so many of our supporters here today. We so value your connection with the College of Science and with the extraordinary research that is being carried out in our college to expand the power of science. And we so appreciate your partnership as we ever are on the march towards greater excellence in research across our college. I am thrilled today to pre-introduce Dr. James Monahan. Professor John Tilley, who is chair of the biology department will actually do this, but I wanna give a bit of a spin for today's talk. You know, one of the great dreams of humanity is to be able to regrow body parts, whether you have lost a limb or injured a spinal cord or had some other aspect of um, injury to the body. It has been so long a dream that we may be able to fix this by regrowing, by regenerating our body parts. This has been such an elusive thing to understand. There are body parts we do regrow, but there are many, many that we are unable to do. The research that you'll hear today is from an extraordinary investigator who has made such insight into understanding the whole process, this whole dream of regeneration in a new, um, in, in a particular context. And I'm thrilled that we will bring um, Professor Monahan to you to discuss his work. The biology department at Northeastern is an outstanding collection of research that goes across the spectrum of what is important in life, in human health, and is represented by so many top investigators, all the way from aging research through antimicrobial resistance to regeneration, as you will hear today, and to other aspects that impact the greatest human health challenges and the greatest challenges in life sciences on our planet. That is enough for me. That is enough preamble. You know my enthusiasm and my enormous respect for the investigators at the college and for the biology department. So let me hand this over now to Professor Tilly who will introduce Professor Monahan more thoroughly. Thank you, Dean Siv. I've very much appreciate the uh, pre-introduction because it really, I think, sets out uh, a key part of the biology department, which is our, our keen focus on regenerative medicine uh, and the tools of regenerative biology to help in, improve human, the human condition, uh, as well as healthy aging. Uh, James is a key part of that thrust within our department. Uh, he has been incredibly productive since his uh, joining of Northeastern in 2012. We were lucky to recruit James here after he did his postdoc at the University of Florida and his PhD at the University of Kentucky. Uh, in 2018, he was uh, given an award of tenure and promoted to associate professor, which was all highly deserved. He's one of our more productive investigators uh, in the college. Uh, in his time here, he's published 25 peer reviewed articles in top journals, including the National Academy of Sciences, Gastroenterology and eLife just this year. Um, he currently is a principal investigator on an NIH R01 uh, Individual Investigator Award. He also is a PI on an NSF award, the National Science Foundation, uh, as well as an award from the Retina Research Foundation. So he's pretty broad in his research. Uh, and importantly, I think reflective of James's approach to science, he is highly interdisciplinary and he also serves as a co-PI uh, on multiple sub awards, uh, totaling five actually awards with other investigators. Uh, really, I think epitomizing uh, the heart and soul of Northeastern, which is to bring investigators together to tackle some of these great challenges. Uh, he's recently become the Associate Director of the Institute for Chemical Imaging of Living Systems at Northeastern University, which is just an outstanding core facility. Uh, and in addition to all this wonderful teaching, James is a phenomenal mentor in the laboratory. He has a, a uh, just a, a devotion to his graduate students and undergraduate students. Uh, and on the educational front, he won both the College of Science Teaching Award and the University Excellence in Teaching Award in 2018. So uh, James is a complete package and it's my absolute pleasure to introduce him to the group. James, I'll turn this over to you. And I really appreciate that, uh, that kind introduction, John, and, and also Hazel. I also wanted to thank, um, 
uh, Kevin and Hazel for the uh, invitation. It is really my pleasure to uh, um, present to you today on what I think is one of the um, cooler areas of, of biology. One of the really um, unique and, uh, and possibly transformative areas of, um, of current uh, life sciences research. And I titled my talk today a bit differently because I, I, I really have um, focused my research prog program recently on making um, the acceleration of discoveries uh, quicker for the overall stem cell and regeneration field. So I feel um, making it accessible to um, labs that might not have the expertise in particular areas uh, in order to really ask this question in an interdisciplinary way, I feel that you really need to have the tools at hand and making those tools uh, accessible to as many people as possible um, is, is one of our goals. As, uh, as Hazel and John said, I uh, started here in 2012 uh, as an assistant professor, now an associate professor in the Department of Biology. And many of the images you'll see today is, are because of really what's transformed my research program uh, of this uh, imaging facility in the, in the new uh, building of ISIC uh, as part of the Institute for Chemical Imaging of Living Systems. So our area of research is, um, go ahead and move this. Our area of research focuses on uh, why particular animals have enhanced abilities to regenerate tissues. Why can some animals can grow back entire parts of their body or even be cut in half and give rise to two entirely new animals. While you and I, when we have a, uh, just a minimal scar, we'll, we'll have that scar for life. And I think this area of biology is more relevant than ever today. Why right? we have this whole range of animals that have enhanced regenerative abilities. And we have this area of medicine called regenerative medicine that is moving quickly. We can make organs in a dish. For example, that picture on the top there is a a bladder that is a scaffold that was filled in with, with a particular type of cells versus the bottom, which is a decellularized rat heart that was repopulated with cardiomyocytes and can and actually beat uh, after they fill in the scaffold. But what you might catch from this is that these are usually based upon a scaffold. You have to provide the information and the cells fill in the space. And that really limits us. We're right now at the kind of bag and tube stage where we can make a bag in a dish, we can make a tube in a dish, but we can't make anything morphologically complex like you see on the left here, these animals that can make really intricate, innervated and vascularized structures with digits and, uh, and multiple cell types. Now this question is one of the oldest in experimental biology, meaning the people that study this also helped overturned spontaneous generation, meaning that life came from previous life. This was a, from a correspondence between Charles Bonnet and Lazaro Spallanzani in 1768. But if salamanders regenerate their limbs, even when kept on dry ground, how comes it to pass that other land animals are not endued with the same power, right? Why can these animals do it and why can't we do it? And I think this question is more relevant than ever today because there are examples of therapeutics using stem cells that are starting to help the human condition. But in 2021, we still do not have a great mechanistic explanation for why particular animals can regenerate complex tissues. So how do we approach this problem? So we study the animal itself. We look for examples in nature that have enhanced regenerative abilities. The primary animal you're going to see today is the axolotl salamander. This is an animal that with extreme uh, regenerative abilities greater than any other tetrapod or limbed vertebrate. So we study the, the, the system in vivo, in the animals, and then we use the latest and greatest techniques to identify the genes that might be involved in this process. So this is an example right here on number two of a, a what's called a single nuclear RNA-seq data set. This is over 10,000 different cells where every dot is a cell, and you can actually track every cell through the process of regeneration and start to identify particular cells on how they change over time. And this is really critical because it gives us insight to how a cell goes from a resting state into a regenerative state to regrow the missing tissue. Now, once you have these cells, you really need to be able to localize them, provide spatial context. 
So we have a very large uh, focus in our lab in developing the staining and imaging modalities for looking at these uh, changes in cell morphology and cell state um, in context of the whole mouth tissue. Now, once we have those genes, we know where they're located. You need to be able to functionally test them, meaning you get rid of that gene and you ask, does regeneration still occur? So there has been major advances in the last years in doing so. If a lot of the audience might have heard of CRISPR-Cas9, which has completely revolutionized the way we can test gene function. So once we have the genes, we can localize them. We can ask if they're necessary or sufficient for regeneration. Then we go at it as a comparative um, approach. We look at translational and transitional models that have limited regenerative ability. For example, the middle is the frog and on the right is a mouse that has a decreased uh, potential of regeneration that we can uh, perform comparative studies to hopefully translate what happens in the salamander into a mouse and eventually hopefully a human. So as I said, the animal that we primarily utilize is the axolotl salamander or Bistema mexicanum. This is an incredible uh, species that is, can be over a foot long. It's indigenous to the lake system that Mexico City was built upon. And we study this because this is the easiest animal to uh, raise in the lab, meaning we can raise hundreds of them at the same time. We can get them year round and they regenerate practically everything in their body. We are actually currently doing a survey of internal organs. We just published that they regenerate their lungs, which has never been observed before, and their ovary. And now we have undergraduate projects that are looking at things like the jaw. And as John said, we're funded to uh, understand how they regenerate their retinas. So we come at this at these multiple uh, comparative, uh, um, comparative experiments across organs in order to understand, is there a common mechanism across regenerating organs, or is there a unique strategy at the cellular and molecular level that's utilized for each organ system? Primarily today, we're going to study and, look and talk about the appendage, which would be our forelimbs. And this is a really uh, incredible structure in salamanders, and, and this slide, I think, uh, provides kind of a scale on how impressive this, uh, this is that a salamander can do this. These are four different examples of tetrapods, a frog, a fish, and a mouse that can all regenerate parts of their appendage. Usually it's just the distal tip. For example, the mouse can regenerate um, just uh, distal to its nail bin. But you can see actual 2.5 centimeters of a salamander limb that can be amputated anywhere from the shoulder to the hand. It knows exactly what to regenerate. And you can see how complex this structure is made of muscles, skeleton, nerves, epithelium, and connective tissues. So you need to be able to coordinate all that growth and what to grow back, which is actually pretty incredible to even think that this is possible in an adult system. I think the easiest way to appreciate this is to actually watch this process. Now we're going to have... So this is a video uh, put out by the HHMI. Uh, showing a time-lapse video of a regenerating salamander. This is about over 45 days, which this can be amputated anywhere from that shoulder to the hand, and you'll have a very similar process. What's incredible is they have practically the same tissue types in the same structure as you and I. They have a humerus, a radius ulna, an elbow, you know, one less digit, but for intense, all intents and purposes, it's, it is very similar to a human limb. But what happens very differently is when an amputation occurs, they will actually close that wound within hours, which would take us days to close. And that closure is absolutely essential for regeneration to occur. It communicates to the cells right underneath that wound surface to become activated. They change into this particular state that we're still trying to understand called a blastema. This blastema is a heterogeneous mass of stem cells. It's made up of multiple cell types that coordinate with one another that we think reuse developmental programs to say what is missing exactly how much is missing, and then it grows faster than the rest of the animal to catch up to the body. It reconnects to the nervous system somehow, and you can see it's a fully functional limb after this regenerates. This is an absolutely incredible process that we really need to kind of step back and say, what do we currently know, which you'd be surprised is mainly based upon results from 100 years ago to 50 years ago, and can we use the latest tools to understand this process? 
So I'm going to present some of the three key um, advances that have been made in recent years and how we have uh, contributed to this area using some new techniques that we've developed. So the first is where do cells arise from uh, during regeneration? Meaning you can imagine a cell coming from a distant source to give rise to the new structure, or it could be just within a millimeter or two underneath the wound surface. We are trying to understand what the unique properties of a blastemal cell is. How do you go from a, a cell that's just resting in homeostasis to a state that makes you capable of interpreting what's missing and what to regenerate back? And then we're trying to understand, is regeneration just a recapitulation of development? It must be a bit different, right? So the regenerating limb, blastema, is probably about 10 times larger than the developing limb, right? So when you think of molecules across that might generate a gradient or, or some signaling molecule, that spatial context is actually completely different. So we need to understand what's unique and what's different about regeneration compared to development. So let's first look at this really exciting new um, advance in that is actually just in review now, it's not published, that has been developed in our laboratory. So this is an animal that is a cell cycle indicator. It's genetically modified to glow when a particular cell is in a resting state, which in the middle here, you can see G1. That is a cell that is in the resting state and not dividing. And you can, we represent this with yellow. And then when a cell is dividing, it changes its color to make new DNA to then divide undergoing mitosis and to go back in resting state. Now you can't just look at a tissue and know if a cell is dividing or not. So we need to use these really clever, um, based upon other people that have developed this really clever approach to visualize this in the animal. And we can see examples on the right here of whole embryos showing when cells start to differentiate, meaning they turn it into the muscle within the animal and then the cells that are actually dividing um, in cyan. The developing limb, we can actually watch this in real time uh, in these animals with the dividing cell. And then in the adult, we can start to look at this across uh, different organ systems. So what has this told us? Why is this uh, such an important tool um, in our, in our uh, uh, approach? Uh, before I go any further, I wanted to really give credit to Tim Dewar, who is the driver of this um, uh, generated these animals, made the constructs to make these animals. And what you can actually see in these pictures that Tim took is pretty phenomenal in that we can actually watch the regeneration process over time. So this is one day post amputation, three, five, seven, 10, and 14. And what should just jump out at you right away is that most of the cells in cyan in this blue color here are local. That means most of the cells, if not all the cells, arise from a local source. He actually was able to quantify this and show that all of the cells that start to divide are within about 800 microns, meaning less than a millimeter back from that amputation plane. So all the information that's needed to regrow a limb is in that particular set of cells. Now we can actually go in using uh, uh, the new microscopes in the SILS facility to visualize these and, and really get a, a more uh, insight into where cells are dividing and how cell cycle dynamics is regulated, right? We can look at these, uh, this limb here by sectioning it and imaging in a closer uh, using uh, high powered microscopes. We can actually show when cells are dividing, making new DNA and at rest. And we can use this to perturb the system to say when we block regeneration, how is it impacting cell cycle dynamics? Which is actually a really important question because this is the driver. This is how you grow tissue back is cell division. Now you can actually see when we look closer, there's actually more going on than just a lot of blue in the blastema. There's particular regions that have hot spots that are dividing versus others that are not. And you can imagine when you're starting to pattern tissues, this is actually really important. What parts do you grow versus what parts are you differentiating? And what's really exciting is the use of new imaging modalities to look at this in whole mount in a whole tissue. This is driven mainly by a really talented undergraduate, Eun Kyung Jun, uh, who's been with us for over a couple co-ops in the lab that uses a microscope called light sheet microscopy that allows you to look at 
1.5 millimeters in this direction and up to three millimeters in, in this direction to look at cell cycle dynamics across the entire limb. And just by looking at this particular video, we can actually see we're getting insight into where cells are dividing to grow back the hand. For example, you can imagine in a limb is amputated, you can imagine all the cells dividing at the base and it's just adding new cells on top of that. But that's actually not what happens. You make a small miniature limb and then the entire limb grows out from that uh, across the entire limb, which is really um, uh, was not uh, possible before we made this animal and before Un developed the techniques to visualize these. Another really exciting thing that this allows you to do is actually watch the blastema form in real time. So this is a 48 hour movie of a, the first time I think I've ever seen of a blastema form in vivo, in an animal. And you can see each of these blue cells here, they explode like balloons. That's because that is mitosis. They, they are actually dividing and then they turn off the signal. And then each of these yellow lines here is the developing muscle. There's so much going on from on a, at a quantitative level that we're, we're just skimming over, but I'm giving you a, an example of what these new imaging modalities coupled with new uh, genetic modifications allow you to do. For example, now we can actually watch and label each of these cells using uh, computer programs to count them, to identify where they divide in actual watch cell migration. And just from watching this movie over 48 hours, we were actually able to determine that the early blastema is generally made by local cells and mainly by migration rather than cells dividing to give rise to the, to the new structure. And now this is the first time this has actually been seen um, uh, in a live animal, which is, which is actually um, very exciting. And I think it's a real example of our graduate students being able to work with undergraduates because they have this co-op uh, experience and taking the expertise that they get from companies back uh, from there to the lab has really uh, allowed us to do this um, in a way that I think other programs can't. So the next uh, critical question that we want to address is what makes the blastemal cell unique? How does the cell go from a resting state into that, that bud that's unique to regeneration? So this is a, a, a story that just came out um, led by Tim Dewar um, and Eun, but also a postdoc uh, that is in the um, Sandra Scheffelbein's lab in the College of Engineering, who uh, Esther Camillus is uh, just starting her own lab actually in Spain. So what we determined from, uh, from trying to understand what's the difference in the actual global changes that occur from a cell at rest to a cell in a blastema. And we can actually label all new nascent molecules, meaning making new DNA, which then makes RNA, which then makes protein, which leads to cell function. We can actually label every new molecule that's made at every one of those steps. We can label the new DNA, the new RNA, and the new protein. And one thing that really jumped out at us when we performed these experiments is that nascent RNA, newly, newly made RNA, seems to be globally amplified. It's, yes, specific genes turn on, but actually overall, the, num the gene that is on is amplified, meaning it makes 10 times, maybe 100 times more of the RNA molecule uh, when it is transitioning to a uh, regenerative state or a blastema state. And we asked this basic question, okay, this is unique. No one's seen this before in the salamander. Other animals that regenerate, does this also occur? Something that has a blastema, which in this case is regenerating mouse digit. I don't know if everyone knows, I actually learned last week that uh, we're finding examples in adult humans that can regenerate their digit up to at least the nail bed. It was always thought it happened in kids up till now um, because you know they get their fingers stuck indoors more than us. But it's, there we're seeing examples up to a 70 year old uh, woman who can regenerate her digit tip. And this is a blastema based system. And you can see this is the exact same experiment we performed in the salamander, was also done in the mouse through my collaborator, uh, Malcolm Maiden, who did this, uh, shows that you also have increased transcription in a, in a subset of cells within these regenerating mouse digits. 
So we asked another basic question. I apologize for the blurriness on this. If we go down to the pet shop and get an earthworm and cut that in half, it will grow back and it's a blastema based system. And you can clearly see that this very similar um, phenomenon is occurring also in, uh, in earthworms. So it turns out that cells are dramatically changing their, their basic state, which is really a me metabolic state when becoming a blastemal cell. This is conserved from earthworms to, to mammals. And now we're trying to understand what are the particular mechanisms of when you go from a resting state to a regenerative state that drives that, uh, that transcriptional amplification or, or generation of new RNA. So now we've learned two lessons. One, that cells are locally derived. Two, that cells are completely changing their underlying um, metabolism and uh, uh, when they become regenerative. And then we'll go into our third one. Before I get into that though, I wanted to show um, that these labeling approaches turn out to be uh, um, very powerful across systems in looking at the, uh, the, what we would call macromolecule synthesis, meaning new DNA, RNA, or proteins, and we can look at this at the animal level, at the tissue level, and down to the cellular level. And using uh, computational approaches, we can start to separate out each tissue and really understand how they change in space and time. So the third question I wanted to present to you today is uh, a very basic question, but something that has not actually been addressed uh, in detail previously. So does regeneration recapitulate development? This is driven by a graduate student, a PhD student in the Department of Biology who's actually defending immediately after this, uh, this uh, um, seminar at one o'clock. So he will uh, hopefully be Dr. Alex Lovely by the end of the day. And Evan Munn, who is an, under, uh, uh, an undergraduate researcher at Northeastern who just graduated and is now a PhD student at Caltech. So before I can uh, answer this question, does regeneration recapitulate development? I will give you a 15 second or 20 second overview of limb development. So there are key signaling centers that drive uh, every tetrapod limb, meaning a salamander is the same as a human. It all evolved once. And these are driven by key molecules that tell cells to grow outward when you're developing a limb, as well as cells that tell where your pinky should be versus your thumb. So FGFs tell it to grow outward. Sonic Hedgehog, which yes, it is named after the video game Sonic Hedgehog, is telling you where your pinky should be versus your thumb. And then there's a feedback loop between these. So that is really what we know in mice. And we're developing ways to visualize these signaling processes. This is actually the first, first time I've seen a, a three genes visualized at the same time in a mouse limb. This was taken by Evan Munn in the previous slide, where we can actually see sonic hedgehog where the, where the pinky should be, the posterior side. FGFs uh, and FGF8 being on the outside telling it to grow outward and gremlin. So we have the basis of how a mouse develops. Is the salamander the same way? It turns out that we, we were surprised. It, there are unique differences uh, that the salamander has that are not found in the mouse or really many other, if any other uh, limbed animals. The st most striking here you can see is that FGF8 is expressed on the outside. These, this is called an epithelium that's on the outside of the limb versus the salamander limb. It, it is completely devoid in that area and it's turned into the, it's expressed inside uh, the tissue itself. So it's completely, the compartmentalization of this is, uh, is strikingly different between salamanders and mice. Now, we can't conclude that this has any, um, this can explain in any way why they regenerate, but finding unique uh, uh, expression profiles in one of the only animals that do regenerate do lead us in, you know, in particular directions to, uh, to ask uh, if there's something unique about this comparison that allows them to regenerate. So the basic question, right? Does this actually occur during regeneration? Does it, do these systems turn back on? If you amputate a mouse limb, these cells, these genes do not turn back on. 
we turn them off permanently after we make our limbs during development. That is a known fact. But in the salamander, when a limb is amputated, it turns out that they turn back on these developmental programs. They somehow have access to what was present in development and reuse these during regeneration. And you can actually see it's very similar between this developing limb bud versus a regenerating arm uh, in, this, in this movie presented here. So we are going across all of the signaling centers in the limb and as many developmental genes and comparing what happened during development versus what happened during regeneration versus what, how it happens in mouse and hopefully get at this comparative approach to say um, that how unique salamanders are versus mice and do they use all the same programs. So I wanted to give a quick uh, plug to a, a, a talented undergraduate who is a computer science uh, biology double major who just graduated, who's now doing his PhD at Sloan Kettering. Um, to make this accessible, you can imagine this is pretty intense in the informatics side, meaning you need to stain these tissues and that requires a manipulation of the entire genome. And to give you an indication, the salamander genome is 10 times the size of the human genome. So the computational power of making a probe that can identify a particular gene actually takes a lot of informatics. And this is, this is it can be intimidating or limiting to most people that want to uh, uh, enter this area and expensive. Meaning as an investigator going into this new salamander species, to look at one particular gene, it would cost you probably $500 a piece to go through a company to make that at the minimum. So we're trying to kind of democratize this, meaning if you have your gene that you want to look at, all you need to do is upload that into a web app that David Stein has developed. You can perform this in the axolotl genome, in the mouse genome, or the human genome, and it will, using AWS cloud services, will kick out a uh, set of files to give you all the probe sequences to uh, order these on your own at less than $100 per gene. So you can see how, uh, how this really can open up opportunities to, uh, to new investigators for understanding um, where genes are expressed during regeneration, which is, is critical for understanding the process. So let's look at an overview. How does this actually occur, right? So this is a representation, a simple representation of a classic uh, uh, analogy to a cell going down a mountain during development, making decisions along the way. It's called the Waddington landscape. And a cell needs to then decide, I'm going to become a limb cell. Within that limb cell, you need to decide, I'm going to become an elbow, a wrist, or a hand, right? So you, you actually lay down your identity and these cells know where they're at in space. So we're gonna give the example here of a cell that has decided to become, or has been uh, instructed to become a pinky, at the elbow stage. So when a limb is amputated, right here, we learn that all the cells just proximal, I mean, just right underneath that wound surface become reactivated. And they all know where they're at and they need to grow and change their state, change their identity to a hand in order to regrow this whole missing structure. So how do they do this? They actually go back in time. So they turn into a, a signature, meaning a lot of the genes that were utilized during development become reactivated. And by reactivating and having access to these developmental programs, which you and I have turned off, they can then organize the regrowth of that structure. So that cell that was an elbow cell can now change its state to become a hand cell. And then those can regenerate the complete missing structure. So this is very different between you and I, right? We have the genes to make a limb. It's not that we don't, there's not, there's most likely not a regeneration gene. It's that access to those programs to regrow a structure. So that's where, what really drives us is to try to understand how a cell knows where it's at, how it becomes a blastemal cell. And this is critical information for understanding when we get into uh, regenerative medicine or uh, bioengineering, 
having that information of being able to engineer where cells are at or in space and how they coordinate with one another will be critical when we get into uh, translating this into uh, human therapies. So this is some, uh, some of the students that hopefully you uh, um, recognize from some of the pictures. Um, five graduate students right now, Alex Lovely will be graduating uh, hopefully in a couple hours in a, in a, and up to uh, five graduate students right now, which we have just recruited uh, our current undergraduate as a graduate student in the program. I share a, several postdocs on campus uh, through my collaborations and uh, we are funded by the National Institute of Health, the National Science Foundation, Retina Research Foundation. And we always uh, give thanks to the uh, support Northeastern gives for our undergraduate research, which really enables um, what we can do. So with that, I'll stop sharing and I, I thank you for your time and I look forward to uh, a discussion. Professor Monahan, thank you so much for that talk. It is uh, really the research that you are doing is absolutely brilliant. And I think um, it is so striking to see you being able to look cell by cell in such enormous detail as you can as the limb regenerates um, in the salamander and your mouse comparison studies are really unparalleled. I think um, the um, Center for the Chemical Imaging of Living Systems that you co-lead is truly an extraordinary unit at Northeastern. It is incredibly impressive as to the, capac the capacities, the equipment, and the really state-of-the-art tools we have to address these types of um, extremely um, important and previously unvisualizable experiments. So I invite everyone to put their questions. I know there are always a lot of questions and you might be reluctant to ask them, but I always say, don't be reluctant to ask your question. Any question is a good one. Let me start um, with a couple that are in the chat. You know, the you raised at the end of your talk, the notion of going into people and actually doing something in people. And that's such a, a dream and would be so outstanding to learn from the salamander, something about that would push us forward into mammalian and human regeneration. Um, what do you think really are the steps that we need? I had a specific question about whether we could actually look in a human finger as it's severed without hurting the person non-invasively, but actually to look in the detail that you showed us in the salamander. Is there a possibility you think to directly look at people to see what they can and can't do and where, at least at the level of the imaging you've shown us, where the blockage is for regeneration. Right, that's a, um, that is a very relevant question because the National Institute of, uh, of Childhood Health and Disease, NICHD, has put a large focus on, that's one of their primary goals for the upcoming years. We had a workshop a couple of weeks ago uh, with people around the world trying to come up with those roadblocks. What do we need mm -hmm. to overcome uh, in order to make this translational? And part of the, the limitation, I think, is the access to the developmental program. So then I'll answer the imaging question. And people are really trying to understand ways of taking a cell in a human and turning it back in time to that developmental state. Mm -hmm. And in order we really need to understand, okay, how does the salamander actually do it? So in order to recapitulate this, but uh, we're actually, many groups are even skipping this and saying, we know what a limb bud looks like. How do we make an adult cell look just like a limb bud? And there's actually been really good uh, evidence in a frog and in a mouse that by taking a cell back in time and implanting it into a digit, you can actually enhance regeneration. So I think it's actually um, the access to those developmental programs that we need to we need to really overcome as a roadblock. In terms of imaging and, and sampling tissues in a human, I saw an incredible talk uh, from a colleague last week uh, or two weeks ago, where they have human amputations, and they actually on the end of the on the end of the digit, uh, an amputation that won't regenerate. 
they're collecting the exudate. So the, the actual solutions that are coming off the end and performing uh, proteomics. So identifying all the proteins that are within there that can give some insight to one that is regenerating versus one that isn't. And that's on human digits. And then they're imaging this over time. Right now we're limited in humans to uh, X-rays, MRIs, and based upon the, uh, the imaging we're using, I could foresee light sheet imaging, the ones that we can actually visualize the whole limb, um, getting deep enough in the tissue to start to image at the cellular level. The problem is making those glow, um, but that's part of what we're trying to develop is the, is, um, is the sensors that will tell when a cell is dividing or when it's in a particular state. Um, but you can see, we can't see through our fingers easily, right? They're very opaque. So we really need to get around that limitation. Um, but everyone knows when you put a red light next to your digit, it, it actually shines through. So there are ways, if you use the right wavelength and the right image modality, that we can you know, get you know, at least 500 microns, a half a millimeter into tissues. Um, right now it's mostly at the rodent stage, but I don't think there's many limitations that we should be able to get at, uh, wounds in the, in the, at the human level. Thank you. Thank you for that, um, thoughtful answer. There's a, an interesting question about whether the regenerated limbs are the same as the ones that were there before. And if so, if they're not, why not? Right. That's, a um, that is an ongoing uh, question that changes over time. Um, I would say 10 years ago, a talk would have said they regenerate exactly the missing structure, but it's not exactly the same, uh, mainly on vasculature and nerves and, and muscle innervation might be a bit different. At the functional level, it is a functional limb. It is, it is competent. Um, and integrated into the system that was already, already there. It depends on the species. For example, everyone knows that a lizard regenerates its tail, but that is actually a very different structure than the original tail. It will drop it, but what comes back is actually uh, more of a rod that, that cannot move the same or feel the same as the original. But at the importance of the animal's fitness, meaning, surviving another day to mate, uh, it's good enough. So the question is, depending upon the species, in the salamander, it seems to be near perfect. Um, and it will, you know, the structure is always turning over, so it, it increases its strength over time. Meaning the, it makes a little miniature limb, which is functional. And it literally looks like a miniature limb. And it can start to move that, uh, but that's obviously not as strong as the original. So then once it grows out, the skeleton becomes harder. And a year afterwards, you can practice. I mean, it's, it's, it's calcified tissue. It's a strong bone. Um, so it's, it's very close to the original structure. Mm Uh, so, so we have a question about, you know, the dream here and how far we are from really being able to regenerate human structures and, um, you know, <laughs> what this would do for human health is a two really important two part question of, you know, how far away are we from this kind of dream of being able to really help people who have been so severely injured. And then, you know, what would the impact be on human health if we could do this? Right. So it would be an incredibly impactful on human health. That's, I think, no question. And it, in, in regards to um, regenerating the entire structure, oftentimes you, you talk to a, to a clinician that works with amputees, you know, they're sometimes not looking for uh, the entire structure. You know, they understand that any small advance or, or communication with a prosthetic to a tissue or understanding how to regenerate uh, a bone structure 
versus uh, scar in that region will have an incredible impact across uh, human health. I don't think it's out of the question to regenerate an entire limb. If you look at a giant Chinese salamander that is five feet long, 100 pounds, they grow back their arms. Their uh, metabolism is incredibly slow, so it takes them a very long time. In terms of scale, it's not out of the question. And I think NIH is appreciating that, that uh, some of these goals are that now we can manipulate gene function in animals uh, that was not possible even five years ago um, are giving us access to these programs to saying we can start to change cells, we can engineer them into what we want them to do. I think it's not out of the question. And um, it's tough to put a timeline on these, but, um, but I think you know, any small incremental increase of helping with wound healing, helping with ectopic ossification, which is a really uh, problem when an injury occurs, helping with integration within the existing nervous system, all of these would have major uh, uh, health impacts. And I can give one quick example. And, and if you uh, survey spinal cord injury patients, you give them a list of what their most important um, advances would be to help their quality of life. It's not walking again, right? It's bladder function. It is trunk function. And each of those is actually an incremental increase. If you can increase a bit of spinal cord function uh, beyond what we currently have, it would have a massive impact on quality of life for these patients. So oftentimes it's by trying to understand the end goal, we're going to meet all of those incremental increases to in impact human health. That's how I, I, I approach the problem. Thank you, that's, um, that's terrific. I'll just um, make sure that we are capturing all of our, our chat questions. And again, want to encourage our, our audience here to put their questions. My chat just finished, where'd it go? Ah, there we go, absolutely. Let me extend this a little bit to ask the question of how, um, what the collaboration is like between engineering and using really prostheses with your view of using cells. Somehow we know, and you talked about scaffolds that can build things like the bladder or a surrogate bladder that can be used in, in um, people who are affected. When you think about, you know, regenerating bits and pieces, different organs, is there, do you have a sense of, you know, where in an adult person, the cells alone would do something where there would be a, you know, virtuous collaboration between uh, engineering, prosthetics, devices, and cells. And I guess we already have some sense that sometimes you don't need cells to fix people. I think the cardiac pacemaker is one of those where to fix people's heart rhythm, we're not actually putting back cells that are not functioning properly. We're putting back a little electric device that's got nothing to do with the cells. And so that's an example where, you know, it's not cells that are fixing someone. When you think about, you know, fixing body parts, prostheses go so far, but not completely. It, do you have a framework, um, Professor Monaghan, for thinking about, you know, how best um, the regeneration science and biological engineering and mechanical engineering can work together for a particular goal? This was, uh, this was a big discussion uh, on our two-day workshop on working with engineers and people that work with prosthetics on integrating our basic science of, of cellular biology 
to our real life problem of a, do I amputate above the knee or below the knee, right? That's their problem that they're actually thinking. And a lot of that has to do with, uh, with mechanics. One of their dreams that, that um, regenerative biology can inform is integrating the prosthetic and making them like smart prosthetics into the existing system that can be controlled by the body. I mean, you don't want to give the, you know, the impression of, you know, Luke Skywalker and Star Wars, but um, they are thinking that way. And that if we can engineer uh, a local cell um, that integrates into the nervous system, you can actually train the mind to control um, prosthetic limbs. So kind of mimicking biology in the, in the mechanical sense, and that making a prosthetic, a smart prosthetic that you can then uh, class by, um, for example, right now, what they're doing is they're taking a muscle and they're wrapping it around the outside of the, uh, of the leg, for example, and that can, you can actually control that, uh, that muscle, and that can integrate into a system to say, to close a prosthetic or open prosthetic. You know, this is very early in the game of, of, of integrating that biological information to mechanical information. But I don't, I think it's, it is going to be different for every system, uh, but it does take some thinking out of the box. And we are definitely trying to think out of the box in, uh, in, in teaming up with engineers um, to, you know, take as much information that we can learn from these animals and, and couple it with engineering, I think, uh, I think that's actually going to be, as getting to Kevin's question, our quickest, uh, our quickest line to impact, right? Because each of these areas are, are kind of moving in parallel and we really need to come together. Yes, this, this is just a huge, you know, there's a huge mission here isn't there in the, the field that you're in it, there is this absolute vision and drive and mission to try to repair um that is so complex and where there is um you know such outstanding knowledge as you you've presented us and it seems so tantalizing that we are close but not quite close to be able to um <laughs> to fix people I want to point out a, a comment in the chat regarding the students who are working in your group um, and you know the empowerment that you've given them to address these really visionary questions, um, including our undergrad the undergraduate students that you talked about setting up this. I don't know if you want to talk a bit about the training that you give to students, um, Professor Monahan, but it's very impressive to see your group. Well, I think it's more a testament to the undergraduates here than it is to to you know our training of them i mean they come to us with just skill sets and with the drive to to uh, impact the research program and to and they have an, a, an insight that um they know what our currency is uh in the field of academics right they know we need to generate the, uh, the support, monetary support. So this important work can go on. They have a sense on that being uh, important as well as um, publications. Mm -hmm. That is part of our currency in, in academia is getting the knowledge out there. And they've been able to see these, these projects through, which um, I think you know having these opportunities of, of the co-op gives them um, you know, a longer time to actually uh, appreciate what it takes to take a project from beginning to end. And we've been really lucky. Um, Un, for example, is second author on her second paper now. She was actually on both the talks, we, uh, examples today I presented, she's an author on those papers, um, as well as we just put a paper out a couple months ago with the first author of uh, an undergraduate with, I think, 
they're all graduated in medical school and graduate schools around the country, but six other undergraduates throughout the last couple of years worked on that paper and they're all authors on it. Um, so no, I think we're just lucky in, in being at this school with some very entrepreneurial in the sense of knowing what's important to take a project from idea to, to product. Um, that I think it's instilled them in early in this, in the, in their, in their, uh, in their education. So it's been really uh, a pleasure to work with them. Well, thank you for that response. I think it is true. We have the absolute top students at Northeastern. They are absolutely, you know, the best in the world. And we're so proud to have them here. Um, but they also are very lucky to be um, guided through <laughs> their trajectories of research towards medical school and other great next steps. So I, I think it's a, a wonderful cycle that, um, you know, you've been part of and absolute kudos to our students as we move towards graduation especially we're especially proud at this time of the year. I want to thank you all for attending today's talk. I want to thank Professor Monahan for an outstanding discussion of his groundbreaking work in the field. I'd like to thank Professor Tilly for his stewardship of the biology department and for um, being here with us today. I'd like to thank our Associate Dean of Development, Kevin Thompson, Amanda Gilstein, who works with Kevin, and Diana Bronchuk from Advancement for being here today. Thank you so much much for attending. We look forward to seeing you in a future event. And we so appreciate your partnership and your support as we move the College of Science forward to ever greater excellence and relevance. Thank you so much and have a great day.